And uh, in March of 1945, you know, they uh, called us back and then sent us to Italy because uh, the Po Valley campaign was about to start, you know, at that time. And they needed the 442nd to uh, help break through what they call the Gothic line, you know, which is, uh, uh, you know, the uh, line of fortifications that the German had built protecting the Po Valley. And, uh, you know, the, po, uh, the uh, Gothic line was such a formidable barrier because it was in the mountains, you know, and uh, very steep mountains, and they had put machine guns and emplacements, you know, covering all the roads and things like, like this. So, you know, uh, so uh, uh, American Army just couldn't do anything, you know, they had held up the uh, Allied forces for over six months. And so, uh, so they called in the 442nd, and, uh, you know, Mark Clark uh, was a general of the 5th Army, and he wanted the 442nd. But then, uh, uh, I think it's Truscott was the commander of the 7th Army. He wanted the 442nd, too. <clears throat> and so they compromised, and they split us up, uh, which was unfortunate. You know, the infantry went to Italy, and then the field artillery, you know, went to uh, 7th Army. They stayed with the 7th Army, and they went up north, and, uh, which is another story. But, but then the infantry, like, including myself, got sent to uh, Italy. Uh, you know, for the Po Valley campaigns. The 442nd assignment was to uh, uh, attack the western anchor of the Gothic Line. And, uh, you know, the uh, officers and commander of the 442nd knew that, uh, you know, making a frontal attack on the Gothic Line was going to be just suicide, you know, and we could make no progress. And so, you know, they came up with this uh, very bold but very risky plan, which is to attack the uh, Germans when they are behind behind the lines uh, at dawn, you know, when they won't be expecting an attack. But in order for us to do that, you know, we had to scale this 3,000-foot uh, mountain and uh, <clears throat> to, to uh, come up from behind them. And so, so we, we did climb the mountain, and uh, an absolute surprise was essential because, uh, you know, because uh, here we were climbing up the steep mountain, you know, and the Germans were on the cliffs on the other side, <laughs> and if they saw us on the, you know, I mean, we couldn't do anything. They would have just shot us down like flies on a wall. You know, everything was done in the dark, and uh, uh, you know, it had to be very quiet. And so we, we gathered at eight, about uh, uh, at eight o'clock at night before we started the climb. And uh, you know, we uh, took us about six hours, you know, to get up there. And uh, it was it was a very steep, you know. And we had to, uh, uh, you know, there was sort of a path of sorts, so, so we used to just kind of, you know, single file go up, but then we had to grab the, you know, uh, trees and shrubs and uh, like this to pull ourselves up. And, and it, you know, we were very heavily loaded with ammunition, you know, and so that made it even harder. Uh, so, what they did was they passed the word down and say, you know, if you fall, don't scream or don't yell. So you can imagine somebody falling off a cliff and not, you know, and having the presence of mind not to not to make a sound, but uh, you know a number of people did fall. But uh, you know, true to the orders, they made no sound. So, so the climb to the top was made successfully, uh, and uh, arrived. Uh, you know, when uh, and the attack began at dawn. You know, when the lights start, and uh, you know the first infant, uh, first division, first uh, regiment. You know, which was a hundredth battalion. Uh, I, I mean, the 1st Battalion, which the 100th Battalion, <clears throat> you know, uh, attacked the sector which was heavily mined and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, so they encountered a lot of opposition and so they lost, I think, uh, uh, 15 men killed and 56 wounded, you know, before they uh, overcame the Germans. But uh, I was in the 2nd Battalion and uh, we were more fortunate in the fact that uh, when we got to the top, you know, the Germans are fast asleep. Because they weren't expecting anybody to come up the steep mountain, you know, at that time, and so you know, so they uh, were taken completely by surprise, and so they gave up with hardly a struggle. So we broke through their lines, and uh, you know, maybe half an hour or, you know, or less than a day, anyway, uh, for uh, an obstacle which has held us up for about over six months. And so, you know, the element of surprise was with us, <clears throat> and luck was with us because they were discovered. And so we were successfully able to complete the mission, so. Overseas, it took us something like 25 days across the Atlantic, like on a zigzag route. <laughs> so 
we never took our boots off or anything. We had everything on for a whole month before we got over there. And uh, we landed in the Havre, France right after D-Day. It wasn't too long after D-Day. And then they shipped us all the way down to southern Italy uh, by a boxcar. It felt like it had square wheels on it. It was bouncing all over the place. Uh, and uh, after we got to southern uh, France, we met up with the rest of the regiment and made it a full operational unit again. And it wasn't too long then uh, when they moved us over to the uh, Italian campaign to spearhead the uh, push north from the Gothic line. And uh, that's where I got my indoctrination as a, uh, in combat. So my campaign started in, in Northern Italy until we made a, our final push uh, north from the Gothic line. So I was in an anti-tank company oh. and we were towing um, 57 millimeter cannon. To, it was primarily a defensive weapon where German tanks would be approaching and we were to knock them out. And we better knock them out or they knock us out. <laughs> Fortunately, most of the time, we were on the offensive side of it and didn't have to do too much uh, of the defensive work. But we did uh, use our weapons for uh, knocking out the machine gun nests, uh, pillboxes, and also the retrieving Germans. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we didn't see too much of their offense, which would have been devastating if they, if we missed the first couple of rounds and they found our location, we'd be sitting ducks. <clears throat> so we were lucky to that point. And from there on, it was all uh, adva advancing. There's no defensive. Uh, we kept pushing the Germans back into, toward uh, Germany, and finally, I think it was only about three or four weeks after that that the war ended in Italy. It's, it's a funny thing, if we went into this, this big long dock, and if we had made a right-hand turn, we would have gone on, on a Queen Mary, but we made a left-hand turn, and we got on the, this Aquitania, I think was the name of it, it was a four-stocker, it looked like, it was like the, the uh, one that went down, anyway. So we, we went there and it took us about, the Queen Mary left the day after and they passed us up. And then we were, you know, we didn't have an escort, so we were zigzagging all the way across. But we landed in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. And then they, they put us on a uh, troop uh, ship to Southampton. The English Channel, uh -huh. we got on a boat there, a small boat there uh, for two days. And then uh, we landed in La Harpe, France. Uh, we were a bunch of replacements that we had trained in uh, Camp Blanding, and we were going to repla you know, replace the... Because the 442nd had taken a, quite a beating on the Lost Battalion, and they were down in uh, southern France recuperating and, and, and getting more replacement to f make up the regiment again. So we were the replacement that went down there. But and when I went, we went we across the English Channel, and first night I got I had a hammock to sleep on, but I and then my, my buddy and I we we, well, we thought we had it pretty well hidden, but we went to look for it the next day, and it was gone. So I slept on the uh, mess table, you know, and I guess they when I got out I was pretty sick, so they, they I was I had just, I just thought I had a bad cold. So I wanted to stay, you know, go with the guys, you know. And uh, the medic said, no, no, you're, just, you're going to the hospital. She says, you got pneumonia. That's right. So they kept me there for about four days, four or five days till I, then they, right after I get out of the hospital from, with pneumonia, they threw, me, uh, they threw a box of sea rations in the boxcar, put on about eight of us on that boxcar. <laughs> I was in the, 
I was in a D company in first uh, 100th Battalion. That's the first battalion in 442nd D company, and I was in the heavy weapons, which was 81 mortars. So it was kind of we were kind of behind, but we got the heavy stuff too coming in. But anyway, uh, I was with the mortar crew. I was carrying Alamo ammunition for the mortar. Two and back, two and back, in the, and back and two in front, and a, in a canvas sling. And my, my brother saw it and he said, man, he's how does how he could carry all that? He was in the rifle, uh, B Company, riflemen. Eric Saul is a historian. He likes to tell the story. He says, where the American Army had been stalemated for six months, the 442nd took it 32 minutes. <laughs> we stormed across the top of that hill and the Germans were sort of retreating. They got into their trucks and gear and just moved off that hill as fast as they could go. And they went to a place called Brescia at the Getty Airport. They surrendered to us, two, three thousand German troops. And there's probably two, three hundred of us. <laughs> that, that was, you know, it, I remember our company commander, somehow he had pulled out a bottle of whiskey and he drank the whole thing <laughs> and he passed out. <laughs>